All right, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jay Leader, and my role today is gonna to help facilitate this webinar. So if you have any questions as we go along today, please type your question into either the chat box or the Q&A tab as well you can use. Um, and I can help pass those along if our presenters don't see those today. Um, most of you are probably already a little familiar with Standpoint already, but for those who aren't, um, we are a statewide organization. We're a team of attorneys and advocates working to assist individuals who have experienced domestic violence, sexual violence, and trafficking when it includes domestic or sexual violence. We also provide assistance to system professionals who work with survivors. We do this by facilitating trainings and answering calls to our action line. Examples of, examples of trainings are our annual new laws throughout the state of Minnesota and monthly, monthly webinars such as this one. And we also do other trainings by request. Our action line is answered Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's through our action line that our attorneys provide legal advice to survivors and our advocates connect callers with resources, safety plan, listen, and help callers identify options and next steps. This webinar is being recorded today, so you can check it out on our YouTube page afterwards. The link will also be emailed out to our legal advocates listserv after the webinar. And for today's presentation, right now I'm going to send the link to the PowerPoint where you can find that in the Dropbox and you can follow along today. Um, today we have our presenters, Amy and Akram. Amy joined the team at Standpoint in April of 2018. Amy comes to us with experience in child protection, civil commitments and guardianships, family law, including orders for protection, disillusion and custody, harassment restraining orders, and representing, representing victims of domestic and sexual violence. Having worked as a prosecuting attorney and in representing respondents in civil matters, Amy's nearly 20 years of legal experience and more than that in the social justice field have prepared her to advise attorneys, advocates, and victims with their legal needs. She has received numerous awards for her service to victim survivors. Akram joined Standpoint in August of 2020. Akram has been working in domestic and sexual violence advocacy since 2016. She worked in crisis interven intervention, court advocacy, safety planning, and volunteer trainings. Akram is passionate about violence prevention and resource accessibility, specifically in immigrant and refugee communities. She received her bachelor's in international relations with a minor in women's studies from St. Catherine University. I'm gonna pass it off to Amy and Akram. Thank you, Jay. Um, we also want to shout out our coworker slash housing advocate, Raylene, who was an immense help uh, with researching and just guiding us through this webinar. Um, this webinar is in, honor, is in honor of Women's History Month. We will walk the audience through the history of women's legal rights in the United States from colonization to present day America. Um, there's so much history, as you can imagine, and we weren't able to fit in everything in here, um, but we will highlight a few cases and the social events that inspired them. Okay, so we'll start with the status of um, indigenous, indi indi uh, excuse me, indigenous women prior to colonization. Um, and this is just to kind of give us a framework of where we're starting off um, with women's rights. So Indigenous women held high statuses in their societies. They had equal political, political social, economic power um, equal to men. They participated in the agriculture, har um, harvesting and production, um, decision-making. They had the right to divorce and owning property. So, we know what happened in 1492, um, and then we know what happened in 1776 with the independence of the United States from Britain. Um, technically, we're still occupying um, colonized land, um, and we should be mindful of the rightful owners of the land. Um, this is just kind of highlighting and showing the loss of land um, of ind indigenous folks. and then covering the status of women in West Africa. So prior to the Atlantic slave trade, West African women, similar to indigenous women, also held high statuses in almost every aspect of society, um, equal political power and authority to men. They fought in battles. They were spiritual leaders. They also had the right to divorce and own property, 
which wasn't a global thing back then, um, but there were a lot of countries and societies that practiced this. The first West Africans kidnapped into slavery came to America in 1619, and those were mostly men, but later ships had more women and children. These were doctors, tribal chiefs, um, descendants of royalty, scholars, and spiritual leaders. Throughout this presentation, I encourage the audience um, to pay attention to how not only um, how colonization, um, enslavement, and forced assimilation took away the rights of indigenous and black women, but also um, how we're still dealing with those um, ramifications of misogyny and racism in our laws and um, culture at large today. My slide's not coming up. Okay. There is. <laughs> okay <where's that? laughs> um, so Ikram's talked about the the history and the rights of the indigenous women who were living here and the powers and rights that the West Africans who were kidnapped and later enslaved had. So what did the white women have? What rights did they have? And when Jamestown, Virginia was the first European women who came um, to the Southern colonies and they did so essentially as indentured servants. Initially, the colonies were mostly men. And as women eventually started coming as indentured servants, the social structure eventually started to flatten a little bit because it was an all hands on deck kind of a situation. Everyone needed to participate and um, do what they needed to survive and build houses and fire and food and figure out this new land they had uh, come to. As more people arrived, women were needed less and less to do what was traditionally men's work. And so they reverted back to the traditional European gender roles that they had had in, well, the Vikings came and then Columbus came and then the British came and all of the West European countries were bringing their own traditions. In the Northern colonies, people came from significant religious beliefs. We think of the pilgrims and other folks who came there and they kept their traditional gender roles as well. And so they, both the North and the South practiced coverture, which is a common law brought over to North America from English colonists, which talks about marriage and property laws. So married women didn't have any separate legal existence from their husband. They weren't a person, they had no rights except through either their father or their husband. So she was a dependent completely as if she were a child. She had no ability to do anything. She couldn't own property, she couldn't control her own earnings. So she goes to work and makes money and comes home and it's not her money. When her husband died, she couldn't even be the guardian of their own children. She had no rights as an adult human. Widows did have a right to dower. So any property they brought into the marriage, they were allowed to keep as well as a life usage of one third of their husband's estate. So they could live in the house, a third of the house um, until they died, but it was never theirs to pass on to their descendants. They weren't able to sign contracts, um, but there were some situations where husbands had to have the permission of their wife to be able to sell joint property, but that was a little bit later. So we've gone through colonization quickly because we have a lot more later to get to that's more interesting, but then we get to um, the revolutionary period. This is when... Um, we're looking at how do we become an independent nation from Britain? How are we going to gain our independence and build this nation? So the brightest minds, the founding fathers who are building this new government, this new nation, this freedom that they have from Britain, they're figuring out what freedom means. And they're figuring out who freedom means. When they say all men, who are they talking about? And these are rich, white, male, free, land-owning mines, the greatest mines that we think of. 
are coming together to define freedom, but within doing so, they excluded women, people of color, native indigenous people, um, poor people. Um, and once you've dehumanized other people, you can basically do whatever you want to them because they're below you and you don't have to um, make sure their rights are protected. So even the right to vote during the colonial and revolutionary periods is restricted to property owners who were white male Protestants over the age of 21. Obviously indigenous and black folks were not included nor even really considered as human beings. They didn't count, they had no rights, they had no citizenship, they had nothing. There was initially a period of um, abolitionists and suffragists working really closely together, both seeking rights for and freedoms, equal protections um, from this new nation. They wanted to be included in it and they worked really closely together. Later, we'll hear about the friction that comes between them as, as change happens. So as these minds are meeting and creating this new nation, Abigail Adams, whose husband, John Adams, later became president, was wrote a letter to him. And she said, remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men will be tyrants if they can. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. I love that quote. Okay, this leads us to the first wave of feminism, also known as the suffrage movement, um, 1830 to 1940. So in the beginning, the movement was, um, it had really diverse roots. Um, it was inspired by women from all backgrounds. Um, in their early writings, some of the leaders um, in the movement credit their inspiration um, and ideas from indigenous women and seeing the liberation and the freedom that ind indigenous women enjoyed um, in their culture, in their communities, that inspired the suffrage movement. Unfortunately, as we will learn later, the movement quickly becomes mainstream and distance itself from women of color. Finding this little arrow to go on to the next slide is a little bit challenging. <laughs> okay, so I'm um, just, there's a lot on here, obviously. Um, I'll go over a few and then Amy will also go over some. Um, in 1930, we are, abolitionists are, they really understood the duality um, of struggle, of advocacy. Not only are they calling for the immediate end of enslavement, um, which was a feminist issue, um, whilst working um, for women's rights as well, they gained experiences in um, leadership, in um, organizing, in um, right as writers as well. Um, 1851, we have Sojourner Truth gives the famous speech, Ain't I a Woman, at, the, at a women's convention in Ohio. Um, she speaks about the rights of African-American women, reminding the audience that this movement, movement should, and, should involve all women. Go ahead, sorry. Where's my arrow? Go back. There we go. Sorry, bear with me. So then time is progressing, right? They're writing the constitution, they're writing amendments, they're making, they were like, okay, we made some mistakes. We need to fix some stuff. We need to add some stuff in here or times are changing and people are fighting for their rights and they're demanding that they be included. So in 1968, we have the 14th Amendment, which is part of Reconstruction after the abolishment of slavery. And it says that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the states wherein they reside. Oh, 
except Native Americans, they're not citizens. Um, so I'm not sure what all people means, but there's case law with later where the Native Americans are allowed to become citizens, but as they're doing this, they're specifically and intentionally excluding them. This is to allow uh, black men to become citizens. In the 15th amendment, um, they, sit, they finally allow, this is the Women's Suffrage Act. I'm sorry, this is not the Women's Suffrage Act. <laughs> this is before that. This is where suffrage can't be restricted based on race, color, or previous condition of servitive, servitude. So it gives black men the right to vote. After that, we have the Comstock Act. Mr. Comstock moved to New York from some rural area and was quite appalled by the prostitution and pornography he saw and was certain that this was all caused by contra contraceptives being available. It, contraceptives promote lust and lewdness. And therefore he drafted and got passed a bill that bans contraceptives defining them as obscene and illicit. And um, it creates, a, it's a federal offense to disseminate birth control through the mail or across state lines. And this was left unchanged from 1873 until 1918, when women were finally allowed to use birth control, but only for therapeutic purposes, not for contraceptive purposes. <laughs> In 1907, we have the Expatriation Act, which um, is the principle that women assume the citizenship of their husband. So American citizen women who married a non-American citizen um, were stripped of their citizenship in the United States. And this happened a lot in the Southern states um, and the Western states as we're having uh, people from China and Mexico and Southern borders coming up and they're meeting and marrying. In the 19th amendment, we finally have the um, women's suffrage act where suffrage cannot be restricted based on sex. So this is 50 years after the 15th amendment and there's huge contention happening because of that. Um, but first we have the Cable Act. After women gained suffrage and the right to vote, Congress swiftly enacted this law to restore citizenship to US born women who were married to non-citizen husbands. Um, I don't know why having the right to vote changed that, but that seemed to be a big deal for them. Then we have, let's talk about these two amendments because this causes a huge rift between the abolitionists and the suffragists because the white rich women who were the suffragists got really mad because how can this person who was previously enslaved all of a sudden have the right to vote and I don't. Um, so the National Women's Suffrage Association refused to work for the ratification of the 15th amendment. They were trying to push forward a 16th amendment because they wanted their rights. They didn't need other people to have their rights. And so this causes a huge division between um, Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony over the position of the NWSA. This did not end women's suffrage for BIPOC women either who created their own programs because after this, they saw that the white women weren't going to carry them. They weren't going to ensure that their rights were protected and they weren't gonna treat all women the same. They were thinking of themselves first and only. And um, Ikram will talk about those movements in a little bit. Um, so in 1978, eight years after they passed the 15th amendment, the women's suffrage amendment was proposed to the US Congress, but it didn't pass until 41 years later, although it had the exact same language. And it's notable that also the language is exactly the same in these two um, statutes, these two amendments to the constitution, except for who gets the rights. So 50 years later, women are um, given the right to vote, but this doesn't um, alleviate the division between the, and it creates this huge social structure where there's 
um, more racism than there was already. Sorry, Ron. You're muted. Technical difficulties. Can you oh, unmute I yourself? couldn't unmute myself for like the longest oh. time. Sorry about that. <laughs> can you make this slide go back? Yeah, I can do that. Sorry, folks. Zoom just makes everything so awkward. Okay. So um, as Amy already mentioned, the movement is becoming more deliberately, like just the separation is happening more deliberately. Um, it the second, you know, it became mainstream, it the racism and the classism came out real quick. Um, 1913, um, we have Ida B. Wells, um, one of the founders of the Alpha Suffrage um, Club in Chicago. She's told to march in the quote, black section of the women's suffrage parade. She obviously refuses because absolutely not. Um, she's been part of this from, you know, she's put in a lot of work. So she refuses and joins the white delegation. Um, 1916, we have Janet um, Raikin of, Mont of Montana, excuse me, becomes the first woman elected to the House of Representatives. She got elected but couldn't vote. So very interesting. Um, 1917, uh, the United States um, enters the World War I era. So at this time, folks are very, you know, um, patriotic and really focusing on the war. Women, on the other hand, continued to protest and they're getting arrested, they're getting thrown in jails and really critiqued by the public for choosing to continue to fight for their rights when America is now in at war. So it was kind of like a shame on you. Why do you care about your rights? You should be more, you know, country comes first, um, not your rights. Um, we move on to the next one. So at the end of the World War I era and into the World War II era, men are gone and they've gone off to war and women are left back on the home front. And patriotism is super important and nationalism and Americanism and women had to step into roles that previously had been held by men. So um, it was patriotic to go to work. You were doing your duty by going to work. Um, they were building victory gardens, which was to grow their own food so they weren't draining resources from the soldiers. Um, then the men came back from war and wanted their jobs back and were like, you can go back and make me a cake. I'm going to work. And it caused previously middle class white women to be like, hey, wait a minute. I have rights to work. I can work. Never mind that. Uh, Native women and Black women and previously enslaved women and women in poverty have been working always and should have had rights at work, but it didn't affect me, so I didn't care, so I wasn't trying to get them any rights. Now that I'm going to work or want to work, I, I need my rights. Um, it's interesting to note during this time that also this is when the Japanese internment camps were happening here, um, which is just a continua continuation of the founding fathers attitude that anyone not like us is dehumanized and imprisoned and mistrusted. And while the world is fighting about people being sent to concentration camps because of their identity, back at home, we're doing the exact same thing because it was patriotic. America, so, that's interesting during this time frame. Um, and then we move into second wave feminism. Is we're starting into the 1960s and things are gonna start popping up here. Mm -hmm. So we're entering the second wave. This is the era of civil rights um, and um, student sit-in protest, feminist, the feminism, the feminism movement is focusing more on opportunities and greater personal freedom for women at this time. Um, there's a lot of 
discussion around work and family and sexuality. Bring it arrow. Okay, next slide. Okay. Quickly, um, we've all heard about the student sit in um, protests. They were very impactful. Um, student nonviolent, sorry, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, SNCC, is working with at this time, they're inspiring young folks to get involved in issues that they care about, um, civil rights issues, while also connecting with leaders uh, within the feminist movement as well. Um, I don't want to go through everything just for the sake of time, so I'll keep going. Okay. This is a quote from Bell Hooks in her famous uh, 1984, The Feminine Mystique. She writes, about um, Betty Friedan, who was one of the primary uh, faces of the movement, the second wave movement at, at that time, um, essentially critiquing and bringing attention to the division within the movement that we know from history has always existed. Um, she says, or she quotes, she did not discuss uh, who would be called in to take care of the children and maintain the home if more women like herself were freed from their house labor and given equal access with white men to their professions or to the professions. She did not speak of the needs of women without men, without children, without homes. She ignored the existence of all, of all non-white women and poor white women. This is a pretty common critique that the movement receives essentially throughout almost every wave of the movement. So I just thought this was great to highlight um, this era what's going on okay so before um i talk about the next two slides um where the women of all red nations and the national feminist uh the national black feminist organization separated themselves from mainstream and decided to focus more on issues that were pertaining to women in their communities um i want to address this there's kind of a, a common narrative that mainstream feminism is here uh, to save women of color, not only domestically, but internationally. And that's very common even in today's media. We know from the brief history that we shared earlier, the movement took its ideas of liberation from women of color, um, indigenous women to be exact, um, who have history that where they where they have been seen and treated as equal members of society. So these narratives that women of color are waiting to be saved by mainstream feminism are not, are not only historically inaccurate, um, but kind of promotes this savior complex that mainstream feminism tends to have. These are just two um, organizations that I'm gonna talk about briefly, but there were many movements within the movement and outside of the movement run and led by women of color um, that always existed. So just wanted to make that brief point. <laughs> so women of all right nations, um, they were born out of the American Indian movement um, in 1974, four activists, two of which I have um, pictured here, Janet uh, McLeod and Madonna Hawk. They created uh, or formed the women of all of all right nations um, born, which consisted of 200 women from over 30 communities, 30 tribal communities. They left once the FBI essentially shut down um, America, the American Indian movement by either arresting or murdering its leaders. This, these um, women decided to take that further by including women in the movement um, as the indigenous men from the American Indian movement were excluding women by adopting the patriarchal um, ideas that they got from uh, colonization. So in, indigenous women felt silenced in that movement um, and that their needs and wants were not taken into consideration. The group addressed issues impacting women at the time, including um, indigenous women at the, at the time, including the government forced um, ster sterilization they also believed feminism was interconnected with environmental issues and environmental advocacy, um, among other issues that they addressed. Next, I'll talk about the National Black Feminist Organization, another 
organization that had many leaders. Um, I just have one pictured here because apparently the PowerPoint didn't want to work with me with all the other photos. So uh, we have Margaret Salone here. Um, alongside her, there was Michelle Wallace, uh, Flo Kennedy, Faith Ringgold, and Doris Wright. They also were um, wanting to address not only the um, intersectionality, um, but the double burden of sexism and racism, which today we call massage <laughs> noir, um, and also economic barriers among um, that women, working women and black women faced. Um, this is also around the time of the birth, uh, the phrase um, womanist, thanks to Alice Walker, um, getting away from defining as feminist, right? Feminism at this point is kind of seen as a white woman, a, I should say middle-class straight white woman uh, label. So women of color are using different words to address their issues and also kind of separate themselves from this movement. So we're into the 1960s and 70s and things start popping during the civil rights era and, and the women's movement was also doing a lot of work during this time. There's so much happening. We're going to go through it quickly and we're gonna not talk about everything. We are leaving out a lot of people and we're leaving out a lot of other stuff that was happening. Mm -hmm. um, LGBT rights were moving forward and we acknowledge that we aren't including that in here. Uh, we just don't have <laughs> space and time. We could talk about this forever. So um, in 1963, the Equal Pay Act passed. Um, so the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedoms is what led to that. And that took place in 1963, most commonly recognized for Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I Have a Dream, Anna Arnold Hedgeman was the only woman on the administrative committee for this, and she directly opposed programming for the event that did not include more female voices. So again, we have that conflict between uh, civil rights and, and women's rights being viewed differently and women wanting to women feeling either that the civil rights movement wasn't including them or that their rights were much more important and that those around them didn't matter. In 1960, so um, Dorothy Height was frustrated that women were ignored during this march. And so she stayed in DC after it was done and everyone left. And she started women working with the others, right? People that weren't included in the WASP, um, middle-class straight white women movement. So she worked with um, the Council of Catholic Women and the National Council of Jewish Women who were viewed as other. Um, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law by President Johnson. Um, it almost did not include women. The word women, the word sex, was added at the last minute to protect both sexes against discrimination based on race, religion, sex, or national origin in public places, including schools, employment, and other public places. And there was some thought that the man who agreed to allow the word sex in there was trying to kill the bill, but it passed anyway. And this had a huge, large reaching implications and protects all genders from discriminatory practice in hiring, firing, and harassment in the workplace. Um, it ended the application of Jim Crow laws, which had been in place since Plessy versus Ferguson, which was a case that said separate but equal was okay. This finally ends those Jim Crow laws and says, we're not gonna tolerate that anymore. Um, in that same year, the Title VII Act is passed, which uh, applies to employment rights. This barred employment discrimination on the basis of sex, race, by private employers as well, not just in public settings. However, there was a Bennett Amendment that was passed that limited sex discrimination claims regarding pay based on a different act that said employers could discriminate on the basis of sex in some circumstances. So we have later cases that come out of that that end up fixing that. But even when 
women were getting a little bit more rights, more was like, but not that. Oh, you can have equal pay, except if blah, blah, blah. So in this case, um, if they could differentiate upon the basis of sex that a woman versus a man would be better at this job, it was okay. Then we have Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965. And this is a landmark decision of the United States Supreme Court where the court ruled that the constitution protects liberty of married couples to buy and use contraceptives. So for the first time in 1965, if you're married, you can use contraception. Um, but it's not about contraception. As we'll learn later when we get to Moritz in 1972, we, the women's movement and the civil rights movement has had a history of using different issues to push the cases forward, right? So Griswold v. Connecticut was about the right to privacy and that the Bill of Rights prevents the states from making what I do at my home, in my bedroom, illegal. So it allowed the contraception. It wasn't about contraception, it was about privacy, but because that was the case that they took forward, that was what was born. Um, <clears throat> then we have the executive order, uh, which expanded President Johnson's affirmative action policy in 1965. Also, so um, that's to cover discrimination based on sex, resulting in federal agencies and contractors taking active measures to ensure that all women, as well as minorities, have access to education and employment opportunities equal to white males. It actually requires affirmative action plans for hiring women. You have to write out what are you gonna to do to make sure that women and people of color are having equal opportunities to education and employment. Then we have in 1969, Weeks versus Southern Bell. A lot of the, of the cases that result in changes, the defense of the men or the government or the people against the changes are couched in this idea that women need to be protective. It's very paternalistic and patriarchal and that women can't do that. And so we don't wanna put that on them. And they try to make that argument sounding like they're doing a good thing. So in Weeks v. Southern Bell, um, Miss Lorena Weeks wanted to apply for a job. Um, as a switchman, which re require her to lift 30 pounds um, and possibly if she was on call, work alone overnight from 12 to six if she had to go fix a switch. So we can't let women do that. We need to protect them from these kind of jobs. But um, she said, no, I want the job. And oh, by the way, the typewriter I'm currently using as a secretary, it weighs over 30 pounds, as do my children. So I think I can lift that. Thank you very much. And the issue in this case was then another different issue, whether sex is a bona fide occupational qualification for the switchman's job. Yes, you have to be able to lift 30 pounds. Maybe some women can't lift 30 pounds and they wouldn't be eligible for the job then because it requires that you lift 30 pounds. But being a male is not a bona fide qualification, being able to do the job is the bona fide qualification. And so under Title VII, that um, they were not allowed to do that. And they had to fix that so that women could be in these jobs. In 1969, we also have the first no-fault um, divorce laws that came through in California. Um, allowing couples to divorce by mutual consent. Previously, all divorce laws had required that one of the parties make a claim against the other of wrongdoing. Um, and this just says, if you wanna get divorced, you get to get divorced. That eventually spread to, by 2010 to all of the states. Um, in Schultz v. Wheaton, an, another um, case where we're talking about jobs, women versus men. Um, in this one, the court held that jobs held by men and women must be substantially equal, but not identical to fall under the protection of the Equal Pay Act, and that it is therefore illegal for employees to change the job titles 
of women workers in order to pay them less. So if they're doing the same job, you can't just say, well, this job title makes this much money and this job title makes this much money and put all the women in the lower paying one. If they're doing the same work, they get the same pay. So it says basically that, so actually this is really interesting because the secretary of state of, sorry, secretary of labor for that state brought this action against a private company when they found out that um, the female selector packers were being paid 214 an hour, which is 10% less than the 235 an hour that the males were making. And they said it is based solely on sex and that it's discrimination. Their titles of their jobs literally were female selector packers. And the other title of the different job was male selector packers, but they did the same job, <laughs> but the females got paid less. And the court said, you can't do that. Thankfully. So then we have Title 10, um, which is the provision that public health service, it's the Public Health Service Act, Title 10. And it's the only American federal program then and now devoted solely to the provision of family planning services nationwide. Um, in Phillips v. Martin Marietta, also in 1970, um, the Supreme Court outlaws the practice in private employers refusing to hire women with preschool children. So this job was hiring people and specifically said, oh, we're not interviewing women with children who are preschool age for this job. You can't apply. And she was like, uh, why not? You have men working here who have children who are preschool age. And she appealed under the um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, she sued. And it, this was found another new language we're using to define it, right? Is there a business necessity? Does it somehow hurt her ability to do the job that she has children that are preschool age versus a man who has children who are preschool age? And they're trying to say that the women's role is in the home and that women need to take care of the kids and they're gonna be, if the kids are sick, the mom's gonna be gone. And so we're not gonna hire you because you're never gonna be here. And the court said, if that's the only reason, but you're doing the exact, you are allowing it for men, it's solely on the basis of sex and it's not approved. Um, can't do that. Title seven says you can't do that. In 1972, we have Einstein, Einstadt, Einstadt. <laughs> it's a German name, not an Irish name. So I can't say it today. Um, v. Baird, and in this case, they ruled that unmarried couples also have the right to use contraceptive. Um, and this is not based on sex, but this is based on treating people differently under the Equal Rights Amendment. So if people are supposed to be treated the same in the same circumstances, you can't treat married people differently than you treat unmarried people. And so if that's the basis for your law, then it's not okay. Everyone has equal rights under the Equal Rights Am Amendment, uh, Title uh, 14th Amendment. And so that they found that that statute in that state violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Again, looking at equal rights versus can you use contraception? It's never about the issue that we gain the rights for when you're looking at the court cases. Then we have Title IX, which uh, many of us know about. We hear about it and talk about it a lot more often than other uh, education amendments, other kinds of acts that aren't statutes. Um, so this is a comprehensive federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any federally funded education program or activities. Um, then we have Moritz, which is a big case and my favorite because we will soon get to her, but uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is along with her husband arguing this case. This is a tax case. Moritz wanted to claim a deduction on his taxes because he was caring for his invalid mother and anyone that you are providing more than 50% of the care for, you get to use as a deduction. But the statute at that time in the tax act said specifically, who could use that deduction and he didn't qualify. Um, 
on the basis of sex. So when we talk about on the basis of sex, it's a big argument that then is used through lots of other things. So what if you're doing it only on the basis of sex, you can't do it. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg first makes this argument in Moritz. So she says, um, the tax code denied deducting solely to a man who has never been married in, a lot, in its allowance to women and widowers, divorcees, and husbands under circumstances, certain circumstances, was arbitrary, irrational, and a denial of due process. So the statute said that um, the deduction is limited to women, widowers, or divorcees, or a husband whose wife is incapacitated or institutionalized. So single men who've never been married can't be divorced or widowed, and therefore, even if they have a dependent, cannot use this tax deduction because they don't fit into these terms. And she said that it was solely on the basis of sex. Um, there's a lot of conversation that's really interesting and I really like this case, but we don't have time to go through it. Um, but basically the court concluded that the classification is an invidious discrimination and invalid under the due process principles and violates the equal protection clause. Hi. Uh, so then in 1973, we have Roe v. Wade, which again is allows abortion, but the issue that the court's talking about is privacy. Um, state laws were uncon, Roe challenges the law that convicts people if they think, if they have an abortion, saying that it's unconstitutionally vague and it abridges her right of personal privacy. And she throws out all these amendments, the first, fourth, fifth, ninth, and 14th. Um, and the conclusion is that it was inherent in the due process clause of the 14th amendment that it is a fundamental right to privacy. And this amendment protects against state actions that interfere with your right to privacy and a woman's right to choose what medical procedures she's gonna undergo or whether to choose to have an abortion falls under the privacy rights. So they're not finding you can have an abortion, they're finding that the statute in, interfered with privacy rights. Um, in 1974, we then have the Housing Discrimination Act, which is passed and uh, says that you cannot discriminate when providing housing based on sex, and credit discrimination against women was also outlawed by Congress. There are women divorced prior to this. There's lots of bad cases prior to this, but this is when uh, divorce starts to be more common and women are not all in the workforce yet because of traditional roles that they were still undertaking from colonial days. Um, and so they were being discriminated against because they don't have the credit rating that their husband had because everything was in his name. It uh, does not allow for that to happen anymore. Then we have the Women's Educational and Equity Act, which was enacted in 1974 uh, to promote educational equality for American girls and women. Um, it provides funds to help actually enforce and meet the requirements of Title IX of the Education Amendment. So that's good. In 1975, we then have Taylor versus Louisiana, where the court held that a woman could not be excluded from being in a jury on the basis of having to register for jury duty. So there was this 1961 law, which had been affirmed previously, saying that men all who are citizens can be called for jury duty but women are only gonna be called for jury duty if they specially sign up to be on the list because we need to protect them. We shouldn't require them to do jury duty. That would be too hard for them. So uh, that the appellant actually was a male who was convicted of a crime, but there were no women on his jury. And he was like, wait a minute, that's not fair. And um, so 
they overturned it. That law was overturned and women were then also to be called for jury duty. Good or bad, like jury duty or not like jury duty, I think it would be fascinating. My brother was the foreman on a jury last night and I'm so, so jealous. I wanna know what happened, <laughs> but I'll never get to be on a jury. But women can now, yay. <laughs> So then in 1978, we have the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which banned employment discrimination against pregnant women, stating that they cannot be fired or denied a job or a promotion based on being pregnant, nor can they be forced to take pregnancy leave if they're willing and able to work. So you can't make them go away when they have a baby unless they want to. Okay, now we're going to get a little personal. You're going to hear Amy soapbox for a minute because this may be my favorite slide. Women's history and rights are not very old. The right to vote happened during my grandmother's lifetime. The right to divorce because I want to happened during my mother's lifetime. And the first women to do significant things happened in my lifetime. In the early 80s, I was old enough to remember, I was 10-ish. And in 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor was the first female Supreme Court justice ever. And I saw that on my TV and I was like, a girl can be on the Supreme Court, having been raised in a patriarchal, traditional, old school family, right? Girls stay home. My mom was a, a homemaker and was a great mother and I appreciate all the stuff she did, but that's what girls do. And then in 1984, Geraldine Ferraro was um, chosen by Walter Mondale to be his vice presidential um, nominee to run along with him for president. And she was an, an amazing person, but also seeing her like, you know, we're like in my little living room with my antenna TV and uh, political ads coming on all the time as they do. So I'm watching my little TV, whatever my dad was watching, probably I was just sitting there. But I see these ads for, and I see Geraldine Ferraro talking and I see Sandra Day O'Connor getting selected and passed unanimously to be the first woman on the Supreme Court. And like, literally because of these two women, I was like, I could be a lawyer. I wanted to be Sandra Day O'Connor when I was a little girl. Like I was convinced I was gonna be on the Supreme Court. Trust and believe that is not happening. But <laughs> it allowed me to see representation of people who looked like me doing something that I was like, oh, I could do this. This is in my lifetime, people. I'm not that old. <laughs> I mean, I am, but not that old. And so it's just really important that we continue to have representation of people who look like people. We always talk about that through advocacy and through the women's movement. We want to have welcoming advocacy centers. We want to have welcoming shelters where women can see other women who look like them and know that they'll be accepted and trusted and comfortable there. So then in 1984, oh, let me tell you about Geraldine Ferraro first, because she was pretty cool. Um, so before running for vice president, she was a public school teacher and then she eventually went to law school and was hired by the Queens County Attorney's Office in New York and headed the new Special Victims Bureau where they dealt solely with sex crimes, child abuse and domestic violence. And when she was in the House of Representatives, she focused on pushing through legislation to bring equity for women in the areas of wages, pension and retirement plans. So she was pretty cool. Then, 1993, I was in high school. My favorite, your favorite, 
everyone's favorite, the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She crumbs clapping while she's on mute. <laughs> um, she becomes the second uh, female Supreme Court justice. And we know all the work that she's done to, to work for women's rights and equality and protection for all people. As a Jewish woman who had lots of limitations coming up with her mother dying when she was very young, getting married, her husband having cancer and dying, I mean, relatively young, all of the things that she's gone through. She um, pushed through the Moritz case, that tax case. She is an ACLU attorney um, protecting women's rights. She's doing amazing work for women's rights. And her husband is a tax lawyer. And he comes home one day with this tax case. Like, I'm sorry. I don't care about tax law. One iota. Like, if my partner came home with a tax case, I'd be like, see ya. But she said, wait a minute. He's not getting this because he's a dude? That's not fair. And if I represent a dude and say he didn't get something on the basis of his gender, people are gonna start paying attention. If I start bringing cases showing why equality is important because middle-class, straight, white men are not having their rights protected, we're gonna make change and have a lot of progress. So On the Basis of Sex is the name of the movie about her that talks about the Moritz case and is a huge argument for a lot of the cases she then pushed forward when she was an attorney. Um, and one thing that as we're talking about this, like we're talking through the history of colonization and revolution and developing of the country and then abolition and all these things. And even we're trying, right? The suffrage movement, the abolition movement, we're all trying to do really good. And we make lots of mistakes. Like we're talking bad about it kind of a little bit in this presentation, like they missed this, they missed this. They were intentionally excluding people from this process. But Ruth said in 2018, real change, enduring change that will last happens one step at a time. And so we just need to keep moving forward. That's my soapbox. We'll now move to the 1980s. Thank you for listening. <laughs> so in 1981, we have a, an important case, Kitchberg v. Feenstra, which overturned state laws that designated a husband as the head and master and unilateral control of property owned jointly with the wife. So um, in this case, the husband and wife had a house that they own together. Husband, without wife's knowledge, goes and gets a second mortgage on their home as, a pro um, as security on his promissory note to someone else. Um, in a couple of years later, it comes due. And she's like, I'm not paying that. I didn't sign that. I had no knowledge of this. This is our house. He can't just go do that. And so they were gonna foreclose on her house. And the person who owned the house filed a lawsuit against them. And she counterclaimed challenging the constitutionality of the law. And the court found that, again, under the Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment, gender-based discrimination is unconstitutional, absent of showing that the classification substantially furthers an important government interest. So again, we're balancing it against something else. You can't discriminate based on sex unless it benefits the government, then you can. But it was good, she didn't, like it was a good case, but there's always that little caveat left in the end. In Meritor Savings Bank versus Venison, the Supreme Court held that a hostile or abusive work environment can prove discrimination based on sex. In this case, um, the employee was being sexually harassed by her supervisor at the bank. Um, and she filed a claim against him in Title VII, against Title VII, saying that this is a hostile work environment. 
And initially they tried to deny her claim because she didn't have any financial or um, economic tangible discrimination that she should she could show. All the prior cases had been about money, like right? Like I'm not getting paid the same or I can't get this job. She doesn't have any tangible or financial losses, but this is a work environment. Like I don't wanna be here and I can do my job, but he's being harassing to the point that it becomes a hostile environment. And she succeeded and we now have that language in Title VII and case law that supports that, saying that consistent repeated acts of sexual harassment creates a hostile work environment that the employer then has a responsibility to protect employees against. This case also talks a little bit about how much employers are responsible for the acts of their employees. Like the boss was not the employer, he worked for the employer also, but she sued both and was successful because they said having a policy isn't enough and it doesn't like, you still got to do something about it just because you have it written down. You can't do that. If you don't fix it, you didn't protect her. Finally, we have uh, Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. Um, the Supreme Court in this case affirms the rights of individual states under the sovereignty clause um, to deny public funding for abortions and to prohibit public hospitals from uh, funding abortions. So that was uh, private hospitals could still do it, but there were laws that saying, said that if you were getting federal funding, then you weren't allowed to. And they said, that's okay. Okay, 1990s, third wave feminism takes us all the way to early 2000s. Um, in the movement at this time, there is more focus on in individualism. There's conversations about um, wanting to or reclaiming and redefining and renegotiating what is male, what is female. Um, there's the rise of the ecofeminism and support for sex and body positivity. Um, people are loud and they're angry and they have a lot to say. So. This is a very exciting time. Um, and then we can move on to the next slide. These little arrows are, they really, really are a challenge today for me. Um, okay, a little timeline. We, 1991, we start with Anita Hill's testimony. Um, she's 29 years old. She reports her supervisor um, at the Department of Education for sexual harassment at the workplace. This is, this is a conversation the entire country is watching her. Um, so she, she spearheads this really important conversation that's still ongoing about sexual harassment. She's a black woman reporting her supervisor. So the media does what it does, um, it, you know, attempts to silence her. She has support, of course she has, of course she has also um, critique uh, critics as well. Um, we see the rise of, not the rise of, but we see the resurface of uh, resurfacing of sexism and um, racism, just, you know, the combo that's difficult to get away from. Um, um, and then in 1992, it is the year of the woman. Uh, four women are elected. Um, it's also my birth year. So besides me coming to earth, it's also a really important year. There's a lot happening. We have women that are elected um, United States Senate to join uh, sorry, we have four women elected um, into the United States Senate to join two that were already there. Um, we have the first female attorney general, Jeanette uh, Reno. We have Setter, se sorry, Secretary of State, Madeline Albright um, as well. And the second woman on the Supreme Court, as Amy mentioned earlier, RBG, our favorite. We have the first uh, first U.S. First Lady Hillary Clinton to have an independent political, legal, and activist career. 1993, we have the FMLA, um, sorry, FMLA enacted. Under this law, a woman working for a company with more than 50, with 50 employees or more is allowed to take 12 weeks of unpaid to care for a newborn or newly adopted child. This also obviously protects fathers and men. 
1994, we have the VAWA, which we are all very familiar with, the Violence Against Women Act, and then um, 2003, which I just don't have any notes for here, but the Partial Birth, uh, the Partial Birth Abortion Act is put in place. Um, go to the next slide. This leads us to the fourth wave of feminism, 2000, early 2000s and present time. So we know what's going on here because we're all here for it. Um, feminism really gains um, with the emergence of social media and globalization. Feminism is a global, it's always been a global issue uh, or movement rather, but feminists and those um, and allies are connecting on social media, they are making huge impact because of social media. Um, it's trying to do better and better than other ways, obviously, being more inclusive. There's a lot more conversation, in-depth conversation about intersectionality. We're getting away from that linear definition of feminism and really embracing this multidimensional um, structure, understanding struggle and discrimination. Um, 2006, Me Too is founded by Tarana Burke, um, though it wasn't picked up until 2017 with the hashtag Me Too movement, where um, famous rich actresses are using to bring um, attention to sexual harassment at the workplace. Um, in 2009, we have Sonia Sotomayor um, is nominated as the 111th um, US Supreme Court Justice. This is huge for uh, uh, huge in general because um, second woman, but also uh, thank you, <laughs> but also um, huge for the Hispanic uh, Latinx folks um, as she is the first um, Hispanic American. And I apologize, she's the third woman elected uh, to serve. And in 2010, we have the Affordable Care Act. I don't need to explain that, um, but includes having. Um, include, includes having to provide spaces for women to essentially care for their child um, at the workplace, you know, pump. And 2016, Trump is elected. That's recent uh, memory for everyone. So um, I don't need to explain that. Um, and then 2017, we continue with the uh, Me, Too, Me Too movement. It's not just a domestic uh, movement. It's a global uh, international movement. We have the Women's March in response to Trump's um, election and all the terrific work that he did. I'm being sarcastic. Um, and then we have high level cases of sexual harassment. The country is really forced to have conversations because famous men are now brought to court for um, the women that they harassed. And that's the end of that um, 2000s to present day. Um, let me... We then have. Um... In 2021, we have the women, women's health versus Jackson, which is the recent abortion case that a lot of people are concerned was going to overturn or impact Roe v. Wade. And I think that a lot of people are really concerned based on a lot of the questions that the judges were asking during oral arguments and some of the things that were put into their, um, their final order. But this case wasn't really about abortion, as all of the other cases aren't really about what they're about. And so the court says stuff about it, which kind of gives us an impression of what they might do if something were to come to them or if this case were to come back. But really, in this case, what happened was that um, Texas enacted a law called the Heartbeat Act that prohibited physicians from performing or inducing an abortion if a fetal heart rate can be detected. So it's not a criminal statute. It was a statute that allowed people to sue in private civil actions to enforce this. And there had been prior cases like Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which was in the early 80s, um, that has allowed abortion providers to defeat individual lawsuits against them by showing that it would, um, that them having to pay money and then have higher insurance or whatever, or not be available because they're in court all the time, would 
impede the ability and create an undue burden on women who were seeking abortions if the providers could be held liable. However, that's not the question here per se. The two questions that they're looking at are one, can you challenge this at this point? Because it's pre-enforcement, nothing's happened. The law passed and they sued right away. Um, and so no one's ever tried to enforce it. Nothing's ever happened. There's been no harm. There's been no result from it. So it's a pre-enforcement challenge to the constitutionality of the statute. So the two questions that were ultimately before the Supreme Court were only, can you, can you challenge it when nothing's happened yet? And who can you sue to challenge it? Is there anyone here that has standing or jurisdiction, like we have jurisdiction over them? So the case talks a lot about who you can sue of these multiple people. They sued a judge, a court clerk, the attorney general, the executive directors of the medical nursing and pharmacy boards that license in Texas, and some poor dude named Mark Dixon who said, I never planned to sue anybody anyway. Why are you including me in this? Like, why am I here? So the court dismissed the judge, the court clerk, and the AG and said, these are public officials doing their job. They have under the doctrine of sovereign immunity, which is the state versus federal power under the 11th amendment. We can't say the court clerk can't accept a case for filing. We can't say a judge can't hear a case. Like if it comes, they have to do their job. Then they have to rule properly. And they also dismissed poor Mr. Dixon. Um, but they allowed the case to proceed against the, the boards that license nurses, doctors, and pharmacists. Um, but the, then the question really was only, can you sue before this is happening? And the Supreme Court said, yes, you can challenge it, even though you haven't been enforced against yet, because you're challenging um, whether it violates the US Constitution. And if it were to violate it, it would have an impact on people's rights. But that's for the lower court to figure out. We're not gonna talk about it. Go back there and talk to them about it. So there is a lot of controversy and fear about this case, but I think it's primarily because of the attitudes and the conservative bench that we have right now. Um, I don't think there's anything in the case that actually created harm to Roe v. Wade or abortion rights at this time. We made it, we're done. Um, thank you everyone for listening. We know this was a lot of history. Um, we wanted to cover everything, but obviously we don't have um, the time to do that. So I hope you enjoyed these cases that Amy beautifully discussed and the social um, events and movements that were happening around that time as well. Thank you, everyone. And we have more work to do. We're gonna keep going. Our movements are gonna keep happening. Cases are gonna keep happening and we'll keep fighting for our rights. And I just wanna say the quote again, because I loved it when I found it last night. RBG said, real change enduring lasting change happens one step at a time so we persevere and we we keep doing the good work thank you all for all the work you do in advocacy and out in the communities remember we are always here to support you and thanks for coming thanks everyone thanks so much for coming today everyone thank you to akram and amy for joining us today and i if there are no any questions i will now end the webinar <laughs>